Today, we're going to take a deep dive and analyze the massive oil leak that recently developed on our project car. And through the science of forensics, I'll explain the series of events that led up to this catastrophic failure. The answer that we come up with is not obvious and it will potentially blow your mind. Let's get started. In the last few videos, we've been working on the 670cc Harbor Freight engine that powers this 1969 Renault. In order to improve performance, we went ahead and replaced the stock carburetor with a set of 24mm carburetors. The carburetor modification made a huge difference in performance but we still needed to focus on lowering the idle speed. Now, the carburetors had plenty of adjustment to lower the idle speed, but unfortunately when we lowered the idle speed close to the range we were looking for, the engine would stall and that's because the compression relief mechanism inside the engine would start engaging at the lower RPM. The next logical step was to remove the compression relief mechanism and in theory that should allow us to get the idle speed exactly where we wanted it. Now everything we've done so far has been documented in the previous videos and feel free to watch them if you have any questions. Anyway, with the compression relief mechanism removed, we were able to successfully lower the engine RPM to a more reasonable idle. <laughs> When we road tested the car, we discovered the engine was pumping a massive amount of oil out of the crankcase ventilation system. Hmm. Now typically on an air-cooled overhead valve engine, a blown head gasket will overpressurize the crankcase and cause a similar problem. Let's take a look at a head gasket and I'll show you how this can happen. In the event of a leaking head gasket, the combustion gases can more or less leak anywhere. But if the leak is concentrated in this direction, the combustion gases can enter the crankcase via this opening for the push rods. The high pressure gases will overwhelm the crankcase ventilation system and oil will start leaking from the crankcase. A lot of times, especially on Briggs and Stratton engines, the oil will be forced out of the engine via the crankcase breather. I've seen this failure mode many times in the past. So now Naturally, I assumed potentially we had a blown head gasket or two on the 670cc Predator engine. Well, the fastest way to determine if the problem is a head gasket is to do a compression test. So that's what we did. In order to test the compression on any engine, you first have to remove all of the spark plugs and when you're cranking the engine over, you also have to hold the throttle wide open. Failing to do this will result in lower than expected compression numbers. I think most folks know this, but if you didn't, now you do. Let's see what we have on cylinder number one. Well, that's amazing. We have a very respectable 180 PSI, or whatever that is in metric. Not bad, not bad at all. Now keep in mind, this engine's been modified and it doesn't have compression release. So our numbers are going to be a lot higher than a stock 670cc Predator engine. I'm going to say 180 PSI is excellent compression for an engine like this, and we definitely don't have a compression issue on this side of the engine. Let's check the other side. And it looks like we got high score again. Wow, 180 PSI is outstanding. Okay, well, that's both good news and bad news. We have excellent compression on both cylinders, so the head gaskets may actually be okay. But just for fun, let's dig deeper into the top end of this engine. It's going to be more work, but perhaps there's something going on that's not immediately obvious. Fast forward a bit and the engine's out of the car. I guess one way or another, this engine had to come out and realistically it's only a half hour to pull the engine anyway. At this point, I really need to see what's happening with the head gaskets. Now, our compression test is saying the gaskets are fine and for the most part I believe that, but just to be sure, I'm gonna do some exploratory surgery. I still don't have any idea what's going on despite contacting a few resources and doing a lot of research. For me, this is truly a mystery and I love mysteries. Of course, when I disassemble any engine that I plan on putting back together, I make sure all the parts are marked so they go back in the same position during reassembly. This ensures that the contact area of the parts match and we don't introduce unusual wear patterns if we mix and match parts. <laughs> 
The head bolts on this side of the engine are super tight and that's good news. The only minor thing I did find was there was a tiny bit of corrosion on the bolts, but nothing serious at all. And finally we have the head off. Now at first glance this cylinder head looks to be in perfect condition and later on when I did a better inspection it turns out it's in excellent condition with absolutely no warping or cracks. The head gasket on this side of the engine was also in perfect condition with zero evidence of any leaking. Now I did contact a few people and the word on the street is there are no known issues with head gasket failures on the 670cc engine. And from what I'm seeing the gasket looks to be in excellent condition. The deck on the block also appears to be in excellent condition and I did check it for straightness and the surface of the deck is close to perfect as can be. So obviously there's zero issues on this side of the engine and I went ahead and checked the other side off camera. The good news is, well, the other side was in perfect condition. The bottom line is, this engine's not suffering from a head gasket failure of any sort. From what I can tell, the top end of this engine was in perfect condition, so my assumption of a bad head gasket was completely wrong. <laughs> I reckon in order to figure out what's really going on, we need to dig deeper into the engine, and this is where it gets interesting. In the previous video, when I removed the compression relief mechanism, well, that started a chain of events which ultimately caused the crankcase oil to exit the engine with authority. In a sense, it was the perfect storm. Hmm, this is actually very interesting, and let's take a closer look what happened. So obviously this is the engine with the side cover removed, and we can clearly see inside the crankcase. This guy is of course the camshaft that I modified in the previous video. Let me grab it so we can take a closer look at it. Now right away, we can see holes on the bottom side of the exhaust lobes. These holes were left exposed when I removed the shaft and the two ball bearings from the cam in order to disable the compression relief gizmo. At the time, I didn't think this was going to be a problem because why would it? But as it turns out, this camshaft is actually a major, major part of the crankcase ventilation system. Who would have thought? Now, some of the mechanically inclined folks out there are saying, what? How is that possible? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a deeper dive and you'll see how this simple modification upset the ecosystem inside this engine. First of all, you can see without the compression relief shaft and ball bearings, the camshaft is completely hollow and you can see right through the center. Meh, this really shouldn't be an issue, but it is when you fully understand what's going on. So if we look at a cutaway diagram of the cam, we can see that it's hollow, and yeah, we just established that. Now for clarity, this cam used to have a steel bar inside of it that activated a compression relief thingy. So with the steel bar installed, well, the camshaft void is partially filled, and the folks who designed this cam never intended for the steel bar to be removed. Let's take a look at the side cover of the engine. This is the oil pump, and through a series of convoluted passageways, some of the oil is pumped up to this can bearing, and that makes sense. Now, for clarity, let's put the camshaft in place. So if you're following along, you can see how we now have an open path for the oil to travel across the cam and exit this hole. Now, keep in mind, for the oil to get from this side of the cam to that side of the cam, it has to traverse past these holes, and it's possible a lot of the oil will exit the cam and fall back into the crankcase before it gets to the other side. But some oil from the oil pump will get through, and that's not really a big deal. Now, this is where it gets interesting, so pay attention, and that means put down the Captain Crunch for the next minute or so. Let's take a look inside the engine block. Okay, right here is where the other side of the camshaft plugs into the block, and at first glance it seems completely normal, and that's the interesting part. If I zoom in, we can clearly see these four grooves that are carved into the block. Well, pay no attention to those. Those are intended to supply oil from splash lubrication to this side of the camshaft. This makes sense, and a lot of small engines rely on splash lubrication. And remember, with the compression relief mechanism filling the void inside the camshaft, very little, if any, oil can get from this side of the cam to the other side. Hopefully everything makes sense so far, and we're more or less looking at a completely conventional lubrication system, and there's nothing out of the ordinary, at least for the folks who are familiar with engine internals. So here's the curve ball that nobody saw coming. You see, this void back here is actually the opening for the crankcase ventilation system. Yeah, this cavity is huge, and on the other side of the engine we can see the rest of the system. 
This screenshot is courtesy of Redbeard's Garage because I don't have a good shot of this side of the engine with the flywheel off. Thanks, Greg. Anyway, as you can see, this is the cover for the crankcase ventilation system, and the hole we were just looking at is right about here. And all the oil that was shooting out of the engine in the previous video was coming out of this vent. So this hole is actually the bearing for the camshaft, and it's a gateway to vent the crankcase pressure. Now, how does the crankcase pressure vent through this hole if the camshaft's blocking it? Well, that's a good question. You see, on this end of the camshaft, there are four holes drilled into the cam. Right now, we can only see one, but there are four evenly spaced holes. Anyway, this is how the excess pressure is normally vented outside the crankcase. It's crazy, but this engine is vented by these holes in the spinning camshaft. Now, if we look inside the block, this area is recessed a little bit, which provides some shielding to the vent holes in the cam, and any oil that should get inside the cam and into the ventilation system will drain back into the engine via this tiny drain hole. Hopefully, it's all starting to make sense. Now, when I removed the steel shaft for the compression relief mechanism, I inadvertently opened up a direct and massive passageway into the crankcase ventilation system. That's not good. Let's take a look at what's going on inside the engine when it's running. Okay, before we get started, this is animated using crude tools and video editing. You may notice the back of the engine block moving around a bit, and that's fine. The engine block's not made of chewing gum. It's just artifacts from the animation. You know, this is not a Walt Disney movie, and I don't get paid enough to do a perfect job. Oh, and if you stopped eating your Captain Crunch, you can relax now and continue with your delicious breakfast. Anyway, the oil level on this engine is approximately about here, and this engine has an oil pump, so it doesn't rely on splash lubrication for all the components. And for clarity, most of the splash lubrication is provided by this gear, which is partially submerged in the oil. But that's in a perfect world. On our application, this engine's in an automobile, and the oil is sloshing around the crankcase all the time, and the crankshaft is likely throwing oil all over the place, and it literally rains oil inside this engine case. Well, with these open holes in the cam, I reckon massive amounts of oil are getting inside the hollow camshaft from both the oil pump feed and the oil that's raining down inside the crankcase. And to make matters worse, the pressure from the piston blow-by is also getting into the cam and over overwhelming the crankcase ventilation system. And that's what's causing the massive oil leak. The head gaskets are likely fine, but keep in mind, blown head gaskets will cause a similar situation on some engines, but on this engine, the way the ventilation system set up, I don't think we would have seen a massive amount of oil from the vent. On this engine, the ventilation system is very clever and keeps the oil inside the crankcase even in the worst situation. So, how do we fix this? Well, the simplest and cheapest solution is to put the steel shaft back into the camshaft. Of course, we're not going to be installing the ball bearings. We can install this steel shaft and keep it from moving around by coating it with Loctite. The Loctite will bond the shaft to the inside of the cam and keep it from moving around. Now, Loctite is a wonderful elixir and can be used in applications besides locking threads into place. In order to get a good bond for the Loctite to work, the parts obviously need to be washed really well. I'm starting with a warm bucket of water with some Dawn dish detergent mixed in, and that'll get some of the oil off. This stuff is definitely a good starting point, but more cleaning is going to be needed. At this point, brake parts cleaner or any fast evaporating solvent will work. In my case, I'm using acetone to dissolve and evaporate any remaining oil. Of course, I actually did a better job than what you're seeing on video. The surface of this high-speed steel shaft is a bit too shiny for my liking, so I'm going to chuck it into a drill and give it a once-over with the flapper disc on the angle grinder. This will prepare the surface for a really good bond. And now I can apply the Loctite to the surface of the rod. The stuff that I'm using, well, once it's fully cured, it will retain 80% of its strength at the operating temperatures inside the engine. And since oil is a solvent, the strength is derated a little bit more. Now, Loctite is an anaerobic adhesive, which means it cures in the absence of air. So what that means is Loctite cures after the parts are assembled. Any visible Loctite after the parts are assembled won't have any significant strength, and that's fine. Most of the stuff will be inside the cam where it matters. Okay, that should be good enough. Now I am going to add a little bit of Loctite here and hope that it wicks into the cam. And some over here. 
The bond in these areas probably won't cure to full strength, but it should prevent any oil from getting inside the cam. I don't think this is really necessary, but it makes me feel better. Now this last step is completely optional. I'm going to put this camshaft inside my neighbor's Volkswagen Jetta that's been parked on my property for six months. The idea is to let the Loctite cure inside the Volkswagen type oven. Now if your neighbor has a Japanese or an American car, that'll work just as good. Anyway, if you have any doubts about the strength of the Loctite, try assembling something and then let it cure and then try to disassemble it. I reckon it would take a torch and a hammer just to remove the steel slug we bonded inside this cam. This stuff won't let go, especially given the amount we used. So at this point, I'm confident that the oil issue has been solved and all we need to do is reassemble the engine. And that's a bit of a problem. You see, there was a delay in shipping and I still don't have the gaskets yet. However, they should arrive by the time you're watching this video. So, while you're watching today's adventure with a bowl full of Captain Crunch, well, I'm hard at work putting this engine back together. To some folks, this video may have seemed unnecessarily long, but the point of the video was to thoroughly examine and conclusively determine the root cause of the oil leak. For my application, it's important that there are zero oil leaks anywhere on the engine because of the belt drive we're using. Anyway, that's all I got for today, and I'd like to thank all my patrons for their support, and of course all the subscribers who tune in every week. I have a bunch of stuff to get done, so we'll see you next time. Until then.